Hello, and welcome to the journey in discovering truth, and I am really honored to share with you. I first want to start out by giving all praises to the Most High. This is the first video for this channel, and I will also have another video that shares my, my personal story in discovering truth. And I also actually started originally with a blog, but I knew that that wasn't going to be enough for the Most High because he pretty much told me so. This channel is for those who have awakened and are going through the challenges that comes with it. And this channel itself is about presenting truth. Unfortunately, the truth is sometimes brutal. Some of the things that I share may be startling for those who are sensitive and easily offended. Now, if this describes you, then you should not continue listening. There are a lot of attacks right now to the Hebrew awakening, and that's one of the reasons why I'm actually targeting the topic that I am today. And this video actually examines and exposes the manipulation that many of us have endured for many, many. Now, I do invite you to study the word for yourselves and feel free to click on, there's going to be several included links. I know that this video is going to be long, um, going over T.D. Jake's video, which was two hours long, and then um, trying to adjust all the the craziness. So I just took some of the, the information that really stuck out because um, there's a lot that was to me misrepresented that in this video. So this video is for educational purposes. Um, the audio from this video is derived from the video audio um, titled The Golden Lampstand. I believe that since I first started working on this, as I said about four weeks ago, that the original link of the video that I have referenced and actually responded to has since been deleted. No surprises there. Um, however, there still are several other video links of this particular sermon, so um, I will find those and add those links. Um, again, scriptures are referenced from the King James Version 1611, which I believe is more accurate than some of the other translations, and I will also leave a link to um, the online Bible. Many people have been deceived and just want to know the truth. I was one, still am exploring and learning, which many of you are as well. So please try to remember that when you write your comments. Now, recently I did come across a video, and this is the reason for this uh, message, um, is actually from one of the Hebrew Israelite camps that had the caption, T.D. Jakes is mad at the Hebrew Israelites. Now, I don't necessarily prescribe to many of the camps because of their abrasive, vitriolic approach that I don't agree with, including having um, white people bow down to them and being abrasive and verbally attacking women. You know, because really, that is not what um, Yeshua taught us. However, there are some camps that don't come across as arrogant, um, judgmental, or abrasive, and they do teach the word without malice. And frankly, I've learned a lot from some of their teachings because all of them are not the same. All awakened Hebrews are not from these camps or mixed with Muslim beliefs or whatever other nonsense some of these Christian pastors now are teaching to keep their congregants in their churches because we are now under attack. I'm just going to be real with you. So I will say a word of caution to those pastors. If you're listening, which I know some of you are because you respond to some of my comments on other channels, you know, so I'm going to caution you that if you dare, you know, who are dare telling lies on the awakened ones, you better check to be sure what you're doing is right because judgment is happening right now and it is not a coincidence, okay? So what side do you really want to be on when Messiah returns? Because as he said, as he said, I come quickly. So you might want to just be careful when you're out here uh, spouting some of these lies about the awakened. And actually, you might want to research some of those scriptures for yourself. Get out your, get off your ego and actually re-examine some of the scriptures and pray and ask for the wisdom. Because, you know, it's promised to you. All you got to do is ask. So anyway, so while I did think the title was strange that T.D. Chase is mad at the Hebrew Israelites, I was intrigued. And to be quite honest, I, I wanted to view it. Um, because I suspected that the Christian church is being impacted by the awakening of Yah's people. So the Hebrew Israelites did a remarkable job with this particular video with providing scripture that disputed T.D. Jake's arguments regarding the true identity 
of the biblical Hebrews and other Hidnex um, accusations made by Jakes in this video, um, which I'm also going to leave a, leave a um, link to that video as well. Unfortunately, there were still some comments that they made in the video that I don't necessarily agree with. I'm not going to get into that. Um, but I was more intrigued and focused on T.D. Jakes' comments. And I was disappointed, I believe. So I thought I searched for the original T.D. Jakes video to gain more insight on his comments. And I did find it, and the link is included in below. But all I can say is just, wow. You know, this person, because I used to really blindly follow him for years. You know, I felt enlightened. Um, his book, Instinct and Reposition Yourself, used to be two of my favorites. And, you know, I really fell for the allure of the words that he would use and the prose in which he spoke that, you know, had me fooled. I followed him for a few years, and I knew that he took certain liberties with Scripture when he used it, and I knew that, and I was wrong for that. Um, but I fell for the okie doke, you know, so you see I'm all screwed, um, that he had some special ability to see the deeper meaning of scripture, you know, one that you'd have to sleep, pray, and study, and fast for years to even understand the concept. But then I realized that, nope, it was just an okie doke. You know, now that y'all has removed the scales from my eyes, I realized that I, among millions, are uh, actually being played, while many right now still are, people in this video are. So anyway, I started listening to the video and immediately in disbelief when he said that tabernacle is where lovers sleep. That's what he said. He said the tabernacle is where lovers sleep. And people were actually clapping and cheering to this blasphemy. And to be honest, unfortunately, I probably wouldn't have been paying attention and I probably would have been right up there with it when I was really following him. So as I was getting pretty pissed, to be quite honest about it, I decided to read the video's transcript while listening just to make sure that I was paying attention to what he was actually saying. Because again, his prose and delivery is very alluring. And I didn't want to get caught up in it. Because it's really easy to get caught up in the emotion. I mean, it feels really good, but it's a deception. I mean, it really is. So upon reading the video transcript along with listening to the video, the crazy, and really that's what it was, was even more pronounced. So I noticed that there's a pattern to the madness of many of these teachers and these preachers. And this video, um, his video wasn't an exception. They build on the anticipation of their targets, and I'm going to call them targets because that's what they are, and then use different manipulative tactics to gain their loyalty to increase their own notoriety. And I um, actually will list the steps that I, I found um, throughout this video. So I challenge you that if you are still in a modern Christian church, that you may want to ask yourself, is this your experience? So I first want to preface this with um, Jeremiah 23:16, and and in any of the scripture that I give, I do actually recommend that you read the entire chapter just so you can understand the context of it. And again, it's going to be the King James Version 16:11. Thus saith the Lord of Hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you, that make you vain. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of, and I'm, I'm going to say the Most High. They have the Lord, but I'm going to say the Most High. Now, here's the steps of many that I found that many of the teachers follow. And please feel free to share any other steps that I might have missed um, in the um, comment section. So the first step one is the setup, and that's building anticipation. They get you all excited and ready. Step two is to identify the target. Who is this message that it's going to be for? The step three is the psychological condition. Um, step four is the lies and dependence on the pastor only for true knowledge. Step five is twisting the scripture to fit their narrative. Step six is the entertainment distraction that the show must go on. And then step seven is the shakedown. In step one, and that is the setup, and that's where they're building anticipation. So with the, within the first few minutes of the video, a YouTube commercial actually switches on. And I couldn't help but think that 
they got to get that paper. They got to they, they gotta get paid. Okay, it's always a means to an end. So how is it that they can easily preach faith for finances all day long to their financially struggling congregants, okay, but they require the tithe, which is actually false, and I'll include a link um, to a blog post that I have about it below. The oxymoron of requiring the tithe is that they preach that the law has been replaced by grace, except for the law of the tithe. Now, why not practice what they preach and trust in the Most High to move the heart of those he chooses in giving? Didn't Yeshua have someone pull a coin out of a fish to pay taxes in Matthew chapter 17? Didn't he feed 5,000 and 4,000 men and their families on separate occasions with the little food that they had available? in Matthew chapter 14 and 15? Why don't they choose those scriptures when teaching finances than to require the tithe by the way that they aren't even authorized to take according to the scripture? So if requiring a tithe wasn't even enough, they later charge for the same recorded sermon in their churches. So for a moment, I was with it. I'm not going to lie. I was always standing in line buying tape and not at the Potter's house. I've never been to that church. Um, cause first of all, I was in Dallas a couple of times, couldn't find it. But for a moment, I was with it. I would be in line buying the videos or the CDs. And I was like, okay, they're charging, but they have to pay for the equipment. They have to pay for someone doing it, which I later found out they don't. They usually use volunteers. Um, but also the supplies that they use. Um, so I was like, okay. But now, you know, they can do it for very minimal cost, have it recorded, and then post it on YouTube for free. But wait a minute, there's another revenue opportunity by posting the video on YouTube and adding a payment option or monetizing the video. It really makes you wonder what is the true motivation for the message? Is it to save souls, um, honor the most high, or create revenue streams? Honestly, I think the reason why many of them do it is the pressure of paying the debt of these large churches and operations they created is the catalyst for a lot of this stuff. You know, that is why you cannot treat the church like a business. You'll focus more on making a profit than the teaching. Now, the standard argument that these people come up with is, well, people won't pay their offerings and their tithes. But could this be a byproduct of requiring something that they aren't authorized to take in the first place? Let's, why don't we go to the verse that is often misquoted by some of these very same leaders in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 9. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings? Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. So maybe you can't pay the bills because... So when I was following T.D. Jakes, I would actually watch the services online and became very familiar with their order of services. And it really follows a lot of the order of services of a lot of these churches. So typically before he goes on, there's praise and worship. Now the lights are low. And then this kind of seems like a phenomenon that started maybe in the late 90s and between the 90s and the 2000s. But anyway, the lights are low and then the show begins. And it's actually very comforting to be quite honest and enjoyable as the congregation prepares itself for the star act. Usually the songs are sung or pre-selected as a lead-in to the subject matter being preached. Many churches actually do this. It's like the opening act before the main show. It gets them warmed up and more receptive to the main message. Um, so songs are selected so that it's a preface of the message or the main event. So the goal is to get everyone warmed up, raising the emotion levels, the music, the people, the yelling, the shouting, you know, what's all a part of it. And it actually works, and it worked in this particular video. Um, T.D. Jake stands before the crowd, who is now all standing when he comes on, and they're clapping, and he leverages the excitement in the church. He also references a Wednesday service. You know, it's really selling. It's always about promoting and selling, right? So I'm going to go ahead and play this first audio. My soul cries out. Even when my lips don't go slid, my soul cries out.
Christian. Grocery store Christian. Okay. I'm driving to work Christian. Walk in the dog, Christian. So notice, getting the people hyped, right? And, you know, they're, they're yelling, the air of excitement just is you can feel it i can feel it online um you know and then because back then i wouldn't even been paying attention to grocery store christians the, the walking the dog christian really the walking the dog christian um but anyway that's a part of the the lure that's that's the that's what sells and people are buying it and i was one of the buyers Now, this is the next part is they always announce the important people, um, usually as celebrities, maybe famous pastors or whoever, recording artists, but they always greet them. And usually, especially for the celebrities, there's a area that is reserved for them in the front. Two of them on stage, I don't know who all is in the congregation, but Pastor Darius Daniels, would you stand? I want to recognize you. Good to see you in the service of the Lord. Pastor Greg Hall, would you stand? I want to recognize you. Where's Pastor Greg? Would you stand? Greg, are you here? Okay. What, Brian? They get, sorry, they gave me the wrong name on the card. I was wondering why he wasn't getting up. I knew something was wrong. Stand up one more time. You get a double take for that one. He gets a double take, and I don't even know what that means, but, and there's nothing wrong with giving people honor, but this whole thing, there is a message that this delivers, whether it's intentional or not, you are worshiping next to the famous. This place is special. It's it's a sell. It always show. It also shows to the famous that we reserve a space for you. It's safe for you here. We recognize that you are special, so come and and worship here with us and it is really it's really disappointing so by the way the word is very clear on giving special privilege in james chapter 2 verse 1 through 9. Um, my brethren have not the faith of our lord yeshua hamashiach with respect of persons for if there comes into your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing and say unto him sit thou here in a good place and then you say to the poor stand thou there or sit under my footstool are ye not then partial in yourselves that are become judges of evil thoughts Talking, my beloved brethren, have not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Does not the rich man oppress you? Are you not being oppressed? And draw you before the judgment seat? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? If you fulfill the royal law, According to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. So the Bible's pretty clear on that. Let's go now to step two, and that's identifying the target. Now, in this video, um, TDJ speaks for several minutes, setting up the scene, and you had a taste of that um, with some of the audio that we've already played. 
But don't get it twisted. This message has a lot of things that it has to accomplish with many purposes and many targets. So the first target is to take care of those who are committed to the Christian church or really to his church or his ministry. You got to keep them lost with tickling ear messages and passionate displays. And on a separate note, why do so many pastors talk about their, their ministry? Isn't there supposed to be the ministry of our Messiah Yeshua? The next target is those who are starting to be awakened but have not yet broken away from the church. The message to them will be the experiences and learning you can only get here. I have what you need. The third target is those who have awakened and left the church. Now, maybe in hopes of them returning, I don't know. Reminding them of the experiences and the learnings that you can only get here. I have what you need. Reminding them that all this stuff is in your mind. You're just confused. So come on back home to us and let me teach you. I know what you need. The next target, now this is an interesting one because this is something that the church that's really impacting the Christian church. And this is the millennials and the generation C. Z people who have actually left the church. Now this is different because they have left for a different reason and this has been a great source of concern for the Christian church. Um, those who no longer believe in what they are tell, told, you know, where they believe are lies, manipulations and fables of the church. You know, you can't come anymore and teach this stuff to them with no supporting documentation, no historical fact, nothing that they're just supposed to trust you while when you are outside the church you are a completely different person so these millennials and Generation Z have just said they're done and so this message also targets them and you'll really hear it much later in the video. The next target is a dedication of a, a declaration of war um, to those who are teaching the true identity of the biblical Israelites today. Um, salvation through the Messiah's sacrifice, the true Messiah's sacrifice, not the Jesus you've been shown at Caesar Borgia. He was a murderer, the lover of Da Vinci who painted his portrait and was actually pretty evil. And you can just look that up. Don't have to trust me. Look it up. And then, so it's really by getting that salvation through our true Messiah's sacrifice and then keeping the laws led by the Ruach, the, that which is in, within you. And then the last target is an effort to show allegiance to the Christian establishment and whatever other institutions he's associated, associated with. And I do suspect Freemasonry, but I'm not going to go into great detail on this video at all about it. But do pay attention to some of the references he makes. Look at his logo and some of the hand signs and poses he does while he's even preaching. So, but the biggest thing is he's being very careful not to offend the Gentiles. So he's got a lot that this thing got to do. So the pressure on the modern Christian preachers has increased significantly with the increase of those being awakened to the truth. Now people are no longer afraid of questioning the man of God who used to dare people by saying don't question the man of God. Even though the most high in the scriptures invited us to seek his wisdom. Now, it's also evident later in the video that T.D. Jakes forget that just because he tells someone not to do something, that people are not just going to take his word for it and do it. So he manipulates by attacking their intelligence and, and pretty harshly, and then raising his voice and marching up and down across the front of the church, being very animated to prove his point. Now, the modern Christian church's infrastructure, frankly, is just starting to crack. It's evident in the desperate way some of these preachers are attacking the Hebrew awakenings with all these videos, saying all this stuff, trying to pile us all together into one lump um, with the Muslims and everybody else. Okay? And a lot of it is just lies. So the next step is the psychological conditioning. Now, as I was first being awakened, incidental information that at the time seemingly meant nothing to me was brought back to my remembrance through the Ruach with the true meaning later. So, for example, I have found out that many of the well-known television preachers have degrees in psychology. And at the time, I remember thinking, why would they need degrees in psychology? Now, immediately, 
the thought of psychological manipulation actually quickly came to my mind, but I quickly dismissed it as well because really I wasn't ready for that. I was so deeply personally invested in Christianity that I just, I, I, I wasn't trying to hear that. So that was another clue that they were trying to, you know, the Ruach was trying to show me that I just wasn't ready for it at the time. So let's also be clear on um, the meaning of psychological conditioning. Um, and this is according to um, Britannica Online. So the psychological conditioning is in physiology a behavioral process whereby a response becomes more frequent or more predictable in a given environment as a result of reinforcement with reinforcement typically being a stimulus or reward for a desired response. Now what is the reward or the stimulus for that response? And it can range from a number of things. It could be a member um, just being able to say you're a member of the largest mega church that you know I go to TD Dick church. It could be worshiping next to the famous. It could be all your problems going to be solved. And now he actually says this in this video later on. Um, but feeling enlightened or lighter from your problems. Um, maybe through the prosperity preaching, you might reap a financial reward from the uh, most high. You know, and the reward can be a number of things. It can be financial. It could be emotional. Just whatever it is, it's really based on the individual individual and what they see as a reward but there is a certain reward even if you just walk away feeling good and that's actually what a lot of people do psychological conditioning techniques are regularly used by many of these preachers when the preacher has you repeat a word multiple times loudly clap their hands while saying a word i'm doing the same things with snapping their fingers all of these things are conditioning even plainly telling you to use your imagination and even using visuals and like slick PowerPoint presentation to seal their illustrations in your mind. This also occurs when the lights are dim during the opening act of Praise and Worship show. With some of those songs have you repeat the same word over and over, telling you to close your eyes and give your mind and heart to the spirit. I mean, it's almost a type of hypnotism. Um, now, have you ever wondered why many of those musicians and church choirs are full of mess where, you know, they're fighting over who's going to lead the song or fighting over who's dating who and all kind of mess? What spirit are they really uplifting? Are they singing to Father Yah or are they singing to the audience? Who are you worshiping? What image do you see when you close your eyes to worship? Now, if you see Caesar Borgia, you are worshiping an idol, okay? I'm just going to be real. So let's check out what the scripture says. And and this is coming out of Amos 5. Again, I recommend you read the entire chapter. But I'm going to actually um, identify with verse 23 specifically. Take thou away from me the noise of thy song, for I will not hear the melody of thy voice. Now the Israelites were worshiping other gods and had one foot in and one foot out, thinking that they could try out other idols and other gods and think then that they can go back and sing songs to the Most High. So the Most High wasn't having it. He was like, uh-uh, don't even sing it. I don't want to hear it. I hate your songs. Okay? So now what do you think he's doing today when you're worshiping Caesar Borgia? Because that's what you're doing if that's what you see in your head. If you got a, a picture on the wall of a white Jesus looking like him. Okay? So now that we better understand like psychological conditioning, I want to continue and go further. So we're actually going to play another audio um, and then I'll talk about talk about it on the other side. Last dimension. You're in that season of your life, you want to go into that last dimension where the glory of the Lord is just poured out. Uh, it is important to understand that the whole purpose of God in commanding the release of these people because we're, we're understanding the tabernacle and I really didn't, I really have not taught on the tabernacle, only the furniture. But you must understand that the law is a schoolmaster and you may not know it's a schoolmaster because you're dealing with a nation of people who have been away from their God 
for ten generations. Imagine ten generations. Four hundred years. Four hundred years without God. And if, if the Old Testament is a schoolmaster, the tabernacle is a class. In this diatribe, now he actually mentioned 400 years several times. In fact, he mentions the actual number 400 multiple times. Now this is for a reason, and I'll discuss that later. But here's another quote, and then I'll address how he's targeting the Hebrew awakening and teaching. Also, much of some of the things he mentioned is not even biblical. Now, it sounds smart. It may even sound holy. We may even assume that we know what he's talking about, but it is not biblical. And I'll actually um, talk more about that um, as well here in a moment. It is through the tabernacle that God begins to teach the children of Israel who he is after 400 years of being up under the banner of another God serving a false god and idolatry. Before we go through, first I want to um, get and in, go into some other misguidance because here we go and I almost didn't catch this one. With wonderful pro poetic prose, he adds a false narrative to the story that most of us know very well. Now we know that the Israelites have a history of worshiping idols. That was our, our ancestors problem, right? However, there is nothing in the scripture that denotes that they were serving another God while they were in bondage in Egypt. In fact, throughout the time that Moses confronted Pharaoh, he challenged Pharaoh to let the Most High's people go so that they could serve Elohim. They could serve the Most High. In fact, in Exodus chapter 10, 7 through 9, and again, you can read the entire chapter, the Egyptians recognized that the Israelites served a different God than theirs. So let's be clear, it wasn't until after they got into the wilderness and their leader Moses was gone for so long that they couldn't see the Most High, that they reverted back to their old ways and created that golden calf. See, it's the little things like that that is manipulative to fit his own vision. This opens the door to other deceptions. Now, a glaring illustration as to why we have to study and know the word for ourselves is this right here. Now, I also urge you to read the book of Jasher, which also provides even more insight on the first exodus of the Israel's, um, Israelites from Egypt. They had Pharaoh. They outran Pharaoh. They went down into the Red Sea, and Pharaoh was drowned in the Red Sea. They outran Pharaoh, but they did not run Pharaoh's God. But the Bible says, even though that they were saved by the blood, baptized through the water, went in as slaves, came out as sons, even though they had been regenerated, their minds had not been renewed. So when they got ready to build an image of what God looked like, they built a golden calf, which was Pharaoh's God. So here, so you see again, with that beautiful, poetic, thoughtful dissertation, we get it, right? We get it in connection with his message. However, it is not what the Bible actually said. Had he chose to read the scripture as we are supposed to do, precept by precept, line by line, he wouldn't even be able to say what he just said without someone calling it out. But again, we don't study for ourselves. He's been doing it for 40 years, and it sounds right, so we get it. So let him teach this false narrative. Tells me right away that you can be free from Pharaoh and still be serving Pharaoh's. Your perception and your understanding of God is shaped by your environment. And sometimes God has to take you through a wilderness to purge out the false perception that you have about God and reintroduce you, do a reboot in your life and reintroduce you to God as he is and not the God you were taught. So with this, people are, and I'm sure those people that are clapping don't even know what they're clapping and saying, shouting amen about. So I want to dissect this because this was a slick message to those awakening. Because remember, this, this message has to do a whole bunch of things. And this was a slick message to those awakening into the Hebrew teaching. First, he is actually mixing Galatians chapter 3, that they always like to go to, with Exodus chapter 12. 
Now, perhaps the reason why he didn't reference Galatians to be read is because he would be forced to confirm that the law is not replaced but justified through faith of the Messiah. Okay? And that's in Galatians 3, 21 through 26. In addition, the precepts to Galatians 3, 28 actually originate from Joel chapter 2, verses 27 to 32. So let's talk about this a little more. So the Hebrew teaching is you must obey the laws as required in the Torah and the Messiah and led by the Ruach HaKadosh that is in you. Now, T.D. Jack's message to this is the law is a school matter implying that it is of no effect, right? The Hebrew teaching is, you are the Hebrew Israelites that the Most High prophesied to Abraham would, would, who would be in bondage for 400 years. And that's in Genesis chapter 15, 13. And I want to go ahead and read that. And he said unto Abraham, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for 400 years. Now, T.D. Jake's message is, the law is the schoolmaster because you are dealing with the nation of people, implying the Israelites who are slaves in the first Egypt, who have been away from their God for 10 generations, 400 years without God. He is also implying that this scripture, Genesis 15, 13, without actually quoting it, does not apply to the, the Israelites today. Then he tries to bring a home, bring it home with a deep statement that many won't even get the message. You can be free from Pharaoh, but still serving Pharaoh. Your perception and understanding of God is shaped by your environment. Sometimes God has to take you through a wilderness to purge you out of false perception you have about God and then reintroduce and do a reboot in your life and reintroduce, reintroduce you to the God that he is instead of the God that you were taught. Now, the real message from this is this awakening thing and obeying the law is another type of pharaoh, so you really aren't free. It's also a product of your environment, the people that you are hanging around and listening to that was created in your mind. See, it's not real versus the God that you were always been taught who he is. See, grace replaces the law versus the God that you were just recently taught. Also, did you hear the clapping as he talked about that, the 400 mentioned multiple times? This is all psychological conditioning. And this actually continues the, the video.